Can everybody hear me? Yep. Is yours on now as well, yep. Brian? Cool. Hey, uh, so I'm Craig Ross. And I'm Brian Dodds. And we're engineers on the release to production, or RTP team at Facebook. Our job is to kind of uh, guide new hardware um, into the data center and through its life cycle until eventually it's decommissioned. And uh, we do a lot of work with both teams, internal and external, in order to make this happen. Is it working? Oh, there we go. <laughs> so here's the agenda for today. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the evolution of our infrastructure at Facebook. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about how, how new hardware gets deployed into the data center, basically from be, even before the design phase all the way to when we decommission the hardware. Uh, then we're going to talk about some of the learnings we've had over the years, and we've had many, um, and some of kind of the evolving thinking that we're having about uh, sustaining. And finally, we'll wrap up and hopefully we'll end a little bit early, so if you guys have any questions, we can, we can do a little Q&A. Uh, so let's talk about the evolution of our infrastructure. So in the past few years, uh, Facebook's really grown pretty phenomenally. Uh, in 2010, we were 600 million monthly users, and uh, last year, we had almost tripled that number. But that really only tells part of the story. Um, in addition to that, we, we made a pretty significant transition from a desktop-first kind of web experience to a mobile-first experience. Um, we also added Messenger, Instagram, WhatsApp, and, and other things into the Facebook family. And we've been constantly rolling out new features uh, that help uh, connect people and uh, make the experience a, a lot more engrossing. This is kind of like a, a marketing-ish slide. Uh, I'm an infrastructure engineer, so uh, when, I, when I look at this kind of stuff, Usually what I, what I would think is, well, things are, demand for the infrastructure is, uh, is really large and is growing. Uh, so let's just take a, a snapshot of what our scale looks like today. Um, every day, um, <laughs> bil billions of uh, videos and photos are uploaded. Uh, many of these happen to be cat videos and photos. <laughs> um, on the back end, uh, there, there's a lot going on in order to make that, that a good experience. So, um, just to, to make the website work, all of those billions of video and photo uploads uh, turn into trillions of user requests, uh, tens of trillions of database queries, hundreds of trillions of cache queries. Uh, this turns into huge demands on our servers, storage, network, and infrastructure. Um, and we are constantly trying to improve that and make it more robust and expand it in order to make the uh, experience for the end users more seamless. A little cuteness for the <laughs> presentation. <laughs> so a number of years ago, we decided uh, it was probably appropriate for us to build our own hardware. Why did we do this? Um, well, first of all, we were growing really quickly. And we found that by working uh, directly with our, with our internal teams, we could much better forecast um, the growth demands. And by building our own hardware, that would really enhance that experience. Um, secondly, oh, what's going on? Well, <laughs> maybe just to, can you go to the next slide? It looks like. Oh, interesting. That's working, I guess. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Secondly, um, so as I was explaining in the previous slide, um, there's a lot of things that happen on the back end in order to make the website work well. Um, and by designing our own hardware, it allows us to really work. Um, with the application owners for all those services and applications that are running in order to make the site work and help tailor a solution uh, to their needs. So basically try and, and match the, the performance requirements and, and the configuration requirements to their current needs and also uh, make sure that we're, we're addressing what, what they need to do in the future because hardware moves slower than software. Um, and we can also, we can also take those uh, concepts and, and those requirements and marry them to requirements for the data center as well. And so we can, we can even optimize down uh, to the power, <laughs> uh, down to, I'm not very good with this thing, <laughs> uh, down to the power uh, requirements, thermal requirements, serviceability requirements uh, that are in the data center. Um, additionally, we knew we couldn't do this all by ourselves. Uh, we have an internal motto, which is be open. And when we decided we were going to build our own hardware, uh, one of the things we also wanted to do was we wanted to open up our designs and encourage others to, to contribute as well. And we thought if the whole industry gets involved, it'll build a much more robust 
uh, ecosystem of uh, platforms and components. And we've really seen uh, some great dividends from this over the last few years. Um, by doing that, we can achieve the highest operational efficiency from a supply chain standpoint. There's a lot more uh, to source from. And also, it enables a lot more commodity components. And commodity components are really important for keeping the cost low, but also keeping the reliability high. If a lot of people are using the same components, we can keep working through bugs together as an industry, and uh, we'll, we'll see good, good benefits for everybody. Um, so when we talk about our own hardware, when we talk about our own hardware, <laughs> um, let's try that one more time. Okay. <laughs> when we talk about our own hardware, um, we really want to start with the Facebook data center, the OCP data center. And this thing does not like me. Is there a, like a manual control for this? You can just use the keyboard. Yeah, I'll just go to the keyboard. <laughs> I'm going to drop this for now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and so the Facebook data center uh, is, is really important because uh, at our scale, it's a lot more efficient than something like a, a co-located uh, facility. And it's, not, it's, it's more efficient for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, there's a lot less um, conversions of power from utility to, uh, to the rack. There's, there's far fewer. We're getting 277 volts at the rack directly. The second major reason is we actually don't have air conditioning in our, in our data centers. 100% of our cooling is evaporative air cooling. And how does this work? Um, well, first, fans are going to draw air from the outside in through some wet media as it arrives into the data center. And this is going to cool it down. Uh, this colder air is going to mix with a little bit of exhaust air uh, from the data halls in order to get the mixture of temperature and humidity just right. And we blow that down into what's called the cold aisle in our data halls. And from the cold aisle, each of the racks is going to basically pull that cold air over their hot components and heat it up and into a contained hot aisle where, um, where the hot air will basically just rise and we can send it out of the building. It's basically like a big convection system. Now, this is really efficient, um, but it does pace, place some specific constraints on the hardware that we, we put into our data centers. And so when we do our validation, we have to take special care to make sure that the, the power consumption, the airflow, and the thermals are where we need it to be for the data center. Um, so how has our infrastructure evolved over the years? So in 2010, we were primarily an OEM house, and most of our gear was, was located in, in colo facilities. Um, but in 2011, we started uh, with many of you guys, the Open Compute Project. And with that, we started with the first open compute hardware that, that we knew how to do, the simplest one, which was uh, compute hardware or server hardware. Uh, but from then, we've, we've really expanded a lot. So we've expanded into storage, we're doing network appliances, and we're even starting to look at the topology uh, for how all these network appliances are connected with our fabric. And uh, the first open compute data center was in Primeville, Oregon. Uh, but since then, we've, we've really expanded across the globe. So we have sites in Forest City, Lulia, Sweden, Altoona, uh, Texas, and, and even in Ireland. If we look at this same kind of timeline from a hardware perspective, the picture, at least for me, is, is a lot more interesting because I'm a hardware engineer. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, in the beginning, we started with um, the simplest thing we knew, two socket server, which was Freedom, and that went into the Rack and Power uh, Freedom triplet. Um, with every new, we, <clears throat> as time went on, we wanted to uh, roll out new, better hardware um, that was more performance, so we, we would, would adopt in the new generation. Um, and we had a lot of kind of learnings along the way for how to better cost optimize or serviceability optimize, and so we tried to roll those in as well as we went. And finally, we, uh, we kept trying to make our total infrastructure package for the site uh, a lot more efficient by, by building purpose-built gear for the different areas that were important to us. So today, um, we definitely have a pretty interesting portfolio of, of parts, and we have a much bigger team to help support that. So in the last couple of years, and, and even in, in today's OCP, or in yesterday in today's OCP conference, we've launched a lot of new hardware uh, that we think is really interesting. Um, so on the compute side, we have uh, one socket servers, we have two socket servers, we have uh, GPU-based servers for like machine learning and AI. On the storage side, we have solutions for hot storage, warm storage, cold storage, and even archival storage. Um, on the networking side, we have top-up rack switches and cluster switches. And 
on the rack side, we have OpenRack V2 where you can put all these components. So this is just another view of kind of uh, how our data centers are positioned around the globe. Um, right now we have seven active uh, data center regions and we have other points of presence as well. And we do this for uh, a few different reasons. First of all, uh, the, the site is growing, demand is growing, our capacity requirements are growing. So you gotta build uh, new data centers in order to house all that capacity. Uh, second, by placing the data centers closer to where people live, it cuts down the latency and makes the experience even better. So it's really important that we, we keep expanding in that way. And thirdly, um, it's important for something we, that we call disaster recovery, which is basically you need to have redundancy just in case there's a weather event or an earthquake or something in any region. You can serve traffic from anywhere um, and still make the experience good for the end user. So now Brian will talk to you a little bit about the hardware lifecycle. All right, cool. Thanks, Craig. Uh, so Craig told you a lot about why we need a really robust hardware infrastructure. I'm gonna tell you, you know, how do we do it? How do we get from, uh, get our products developed and deployed in a reliable manner and then uh, sustained throughout their life cycle? I'm gonna give this thing a try and see how it goes. So really our hardware life cycle is just a set of steps and phases that we follow to deploy or to design and deploy and sustain any new hardware system. And keep in mind in this context, when we say a system, we're not talking about just a server or a storage device or a networking device. Really, we're talking about an entire rack and all of the management tooling and application set that goes along with it to keep it running in the data center for its entire life. So at a high level, we can break down um, a hardware life cycle into two main phases. First, we call new product introduction, or NPI. This is basically when we take a product from a very initial concept phase uh, through the design into its initial manufacturing and deployment. On the back end, we call this phase generically mass production. And this is when we go from manufacturing the design to its initial deployments in the data center all the way through its end of life. And this includes all the work uh, that goes along with sustaining and keeping the thing running efficiently in the data center through its life cycle. So I'm gonna give you a, a little more insight into each of these phases and to do so, uh, I'm gonna walk you through a mini case study which is based on our Yosemite platform. As you guys may know, we, we launched Yosemite last year at the OCP conference, and it's our single socket multi-host server. And I think it's a good example to show because there was a lot of complexity, a lot of moving parts, definitely not one of our easier programs to get through the life cycle. Okay, so how do we start? We start in a phase called hack, and hack is really <laughs> All right, maybe I'll go Craig. You want me to? <laughs> Hack is really just an idea um, uh, or a product concept or a problem to solve. Um, so the main goal of this phase is to understand, is this idea good enough? Is it technically sound and does it make business sense? Do we want to deploy something like this into the data center? So generally what we do during the hack phase, um, you know, is, is we work on a mock-up or a prototype um, to prove out the idea. This can be as simple as taking an existing server, hacking it up with new components, or blue wiring the design to meet our new requirement. Uh, or it can be as complicated as a from scratch design where we're doing some fast prototyping. Um, but the real goal is to prove out does the idea make sense. You know, in the case of Yosemite, the idea or the problem we wanted to solve is really to shift our performance and power paradigm for our front-end web workloads. So over the past several generations, you know, we'd seen moderately increasing performance generation to generation and also increasing power. And as we looked forward into the future, you know, we didn't see that our data center power footprint was scaling uh, at the same rate as our performance and capacity requirements. Oh, wait. Oh, I think no. it went the other way. <laughs> you Sorry guys didn't see that. <laughs> So uh, with that in mind, you know, we came up with the Yosemite concept. And a lot of people were working on uh, microserver concepts at the time. And uh, the microserver concept was you know, usually based on a lower performing Atom or ARM based CPU. And so we took a look at some of those designs and actually designed our own microserver based on an Atom CPU. We tested that out and what we saw was you know, our single threaded performance and memory bandwidth really just weren't enough to meet our, our performance and latency demands of the front end web workload. So that really kicked off a collaboration with Intel on the Broadwell DE SOC. Uh, based on this, we kind of you know, coalesced into 
what we call a multi-host single socket server design. And in this case, we had four servers in a single chassis. Um, and each of these servers was a one, had a one socket CPU or SOC. Uh, the CPU was a lot beefier than the Atom, so it did meet our performance requirements. But the design had some other challenges. For example, we couldn't afford to put four NICs into one chassis. So then we worked with NIC vendors to develop what we call multi-host NIC. And the same kind of concept uh, expanded to the manageability on the BMC side and other things. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the design was, was vetted out. The data we, we got back from the performance testing, we said it's good enough. Let's go ahead into the design phase. So the design phase is when we really flush out all the product requirements based on our application needs, our, our data center manageability needs, and this is where the team becomes really fully staffed. You know, we have hardware engineering involved, we have our team, RTP involved, we have our firmware folks involved, um, we have supply chain, manufacturing quality people, and then a technical program manager who keeps us, tries to keep us all headed in the right direction. Um, you know, for Yosemite, uh, design focus was really on this multi-host concept since it was so new to us. Um, you know, when we have one NIC and one BMC serving up to four servers, we now have an increased failure domain. We've got to worry about if the NIC goes down or the BMC goes down, uh, how do we manage all these servers? How do we make sure these things are reliable enough not to decrease our uptime in the data center? And at the same time, we have to worry about things like, hey, if a single server breaks, we want to make sure that doesn't break the other servers in the sled. So that was really design focus for Yosemite. And we can dig a little bit deeper into our design phases. Um, and what we see is really it's just an iterative design and build process. And we use pretty standard terminology. You know, I think it's used across the industry for, for these iterations. EVT, DVT, PVT, and in some cases, a pilot. So in an ideal case, you know, this is kind of what we do in each phase. Uh, in EVT, you know, our main goal is to finalize the hardware design, build it, and validate that all the features are working as expected. So in this phase, we're really building systems, you know, on the scale of systems. Uh, and that would be, you know, a server or a network device or a storage device. In the case of Yosemite, it's the multi-host server. In DVT uh, is when we start to do the full systems integration. So this is, like I said before, where we're bringing the rack together. So we're bringing the, the top of rack switch together. We're bringing all the cabling together, the server, as well as the tooling. So we're building at the rack level. We're integrating these into the data center for the first time and getting all that tooling up and running. Um, PVT, the main goal is, are we ready for manufacturing and deployment? So we need to make sure at this phase we're hitting all of our manufacturing quality criteria. Um, we're building at the scale of a cluster uh, or thereabouts. And so we're also making sure the full application set can run, is performant, et cetera. And then finally, pilot, you know, our, one of our main models is move fast. So one of our main goals from the pilot phase is get that deployment going as fast as possible. So in some cases, this is a smaller scale deployment, but we want to start it as soon as PVT is done. Well, that's the ideal case. In real life, especially with Yosemite, shit happens. So how did this go for Yosemite? So I would say first in EVT, you know, things started out pretty much as we expected. Um, we knew we had this multi-host design. We knew there were going to be challenges here. Um, and so our EVT focus was on uh, mitigating these risks, you know, the, the increased failure mode, um, the ability to handle four hosts in a single server or single sled, uh, and make sure that's going to fit later into our data center from a thermal and airflow constraint perspective. You know, our SOCs we had at this stage were really preliminary versions of the SOC, so we knew they weren't fully performant yet. Um, we didn't even have the multi-host NIC, but we, we kind of knew these things ahead of time and so uh, got a pretty robust hardware system through EVT. The fun really started in DVT. So in DVT was the first time we saw that multi-host NIC. Um, and actually the hardware was pretty solid, but we had a whole lot of firmware and driver issues. You know, things that impacted our ability uh, to talk to all four hosts, things that impacted our ability to talk to our BMC, um, and really, these issues continued from DVT timeframe all the way through into, into the beginning of our mass production. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier we pulled the whole rack together in DVT. Well, another interesting thing about Yosemite was our first uh, system to integrate a 100 gig wedge switch. Um, and the wedge switch was going along through its own EVT, DVT, PVT phase in parallel with us. 
Uh, and actually, they were a little bit behind. So the first time we put uh, the wedge switch into our uh, data center with the Yosemite was in between DVT and PVT. And the software wasn't even ready yet. So we literally had one guy working on his development environment, configuring and keeping all these switches up and running for us as the software was being developed in parallel. Uh, finally, in PVT, you know, we made the decision to integrate OpenBMC. Uh, and a lot of people thought this was pretty crazy because, uh, you know, OpenBMC is a really integral part of the hardware. And, and ideally, it would be integrated in the EVT or DVT timeframe. So prior to this, we've been using a third-party BMC firmware. Uh, so the implications were that we had to rewrite all of our data center tooling, uh, anything that accessed the system through IPMI uh, or, or the out-of-band interface in general. Um, and then we only had a very limited time to test with the open BMC. But you know, our, again, Facebook's motto, move fast. Uh, so we knew that open BMC would offer big benefits in the future, so we made the decision to go ahead and integrate at this time. Um, and as we moved into pilot, I'll talk about this a little more later. Um, this was our first large scale deployment for Yosemite because our PVT uh, supply was a little lower than we'd like. And so we really had the first time we started seeing the full application stack running. And, and we learned a few interesting things here I'll, I'll dig into in a little bit. OK. Now we're done with the design phase. We're really on to manufacturing. Um, and so for our first four to five years of, of manufacturing OCP gear, this is kind of how we did it. Um, we work with our ODM partners to design the systems, and they, they do the manufacturing of all the component level stuff, like motherboards, peripherals, et cetera, in their region or in their factories, generally in China. Those, those components are integrated into a chassis level assembly there, so the full server or the full switch or the full, st full storage device is fully assembled in our ODM factories. Then we ship that, usually by sea, uh, into our data center regions, North America or, or European region, depending on where the deployment is targeted for, and do a full rack assembly in the data center region. Um, and then once the rack is assembled, tested there at the, at the rack assembly house, it gets shipped out to our data centers, wherever those specific data centers may be, Prineville or Lulia or, or whatever. Um, and you know, this worked pretty well uh, for a long time. Uh, but as our data center infrastructure and footprints grew, um, you know, we wanted to be a little more flexible with how we built up the systems and to be able to meet our capacity demands, which, you know, can shift around quite a bit in a, in a more dynamic manner. So we shifted up our manufacturing process a little bit. Um, so now, today, we only do the component level manufacturing uh, at, the, at the factories with our ODMs uh, in China. So for example, our motherboards are all still uh, manufactured there. And then the components themselves are shipped into the regions, the data center regions. Um, and then the chassis level assembly and the full rack level assembly happens in the data center regions. And then they're shipped you know, to the data centers as they were before. The big benefit here is you know, we have a little more control over the supply chain. And we have a lot more flexibility in what we build when. Instead of waiting for the chassis to arrive by boat, we've got all the components there, and we can build up uh, some new Yosemites if our capacity demands increase suddenly unexpectedly. All right, so now manufacturing is complete. You know, we move on to what we call deployment phase. And deployment phase should be pretty simple, um, at least initially. Uh, we roll, the, the racks get delivered, they get rolled into the data hall, somebody goes, they plug in the power, they plug in the network, and they turn it on. And after that, everything's automated. Uh, at least that's the ideal case. And actually, we do a fairly decent job here because we test out this flow through the PVT timeframe. Um, so really at a high level, once that power is connected and the network's plugged in, uh, through the top of rack switch, we, we detect all the assets automatically. We know what type of rack is this, what components are in the rack. Based on that, we know how to provision the rack, what operating system to install, what kernel version, um, what software packages need to be there. Uh, specific monitoring rules get turned on and implemented. Uh, the service gets enabled, and then it starts serving live traffic. Um, so the interesting thing in deployment generally happens after this when, you know, if it's a new system like Yosemite, we may have some hiccups. So w what happened during the Yosemite deployment? Well, like I said earlier, you know, we didn't get as large of a PVT deployment as we'd like. So this was the first time we saw really a cluster level deployment in the data center 
uh, for our new multi-host OneSocket server. Uh, so there were some pretty interesting issues that we ran into. Um, the first ones were around our software load balancer, which really keeps um, you know, the workload across a cluster in the right uh, operational ranges. And fundamentally, because we went from a, a two-socket, very high-performance E5-class CPU that had about 30 to 40 servers per rack to a single-socket you know, CPU that had about 120 servers per rack, that load balancing needed to be tweaked quite a bit and actually had to be tweaked more than we initially thought. So a lot of time during our initial deployment for Yosemite was spent getting these load balancing correct. Um, another thing we saw was performance variation from server to server. We do expect some performance variation based on turbo residencies and other, uh, you know, a little bit of thermal delta between uh, different aisles in the data center, things like that. But, but on the one socket design, we saw a little bit more performance variations than we'd seen on the previous two socket systems. Um, and we had to account for that because our capacity planning tools and our load balancer really need to know exactly what the performance is going to be so they can, they can do their work accordingly. Um, so that took us a few weeks to learn, you know, is this performance variation expected, yes or no, and then how do we account for this in our, in our tooling. Okay, after deployment, we go into what we call the sustaining phase. And sustaining phase really lasts through the rest of the, the system's life cycle until it's EOL. And so the key in the sustaining phase is just don't touch anything. You know, let it be. Um, Yosemite is actually pretty early in sustaining still. It's, it started its deployments last year, and usually our life cycle is about uh, three to four years for a system in the data center. Uh, I do want to highlight one issue that, that, that's come up, um, and that was about a month or two after deploying uh, Yosemite in a data center, we started seeing BMCs being inaccessible. And this was kind of a big deal because, like I said earlier, uh, now we have four servers, you know, being, being managed essentially by one BMC. So you lose the BMC, you lose a lot of visibility into those four servers, even if they're still working as we expect. So the team jumped on this pretty quickly, debugged it, and what they found was a memory leak bug in OpenBMC firmware. You know, and I didn't want to highlight this issue because we missed boneheaded bugs in our development process. You know, I wanted to highlight the issue because uh, uh, for a couple reasons. One, you know, we made this decision to move fast with the OpenBMC firmware in the PVT timeframe. And I think it's paying off dividends in the long run. But two, when you do that, there can sometimes be consequences. So you really need to pay attention to both um, your ability to mitigate issues once, once, they, once they ship um, and, and, and react to them quickly. All right, now we're done. All right, so uh, life cycle's complete. Servers have, have reached the end of their uh, effective life, so we decided to EOL the servers. And like I said, that's usually about three to four years after they go into the data center. So how do we do this? Well, uh, it's a pretty basic process. First, we drain uh, the cluster of any functional workloads. We m migrate any data on that cluster off. Um, and then we go through a very rigorous process to make sure no data ever leaves our data halls. So first we wipe, wipe the disks in the rack, and then we physically remove all the disks and put them through a giant wood chipper um, and really chew up the disks into their little metal pieces. Finally, we recycle the racks. You know, uh, the racks get sent off the, the systems. Uh, the components in the racks will get refurbished and then reused by somebody else that still has use for the hardware. Um, at that time, uh, we generally do the migrations at a cluster level, so uh, a big chunk of the data hall will be empty. If we need to do upgrades you know, to the power infrastructure or the networking infrastructure, they're done at that time. And then we roll in our new hardware and start all over again. Okay, so that's the end of uh, our life cycle. So now Craig's going to walk us through a few of the learnings we've had over the years. Thanks, Brian. So this is the, the same picture we saw a little bit earlier. Um, just to recap, over, over the last few years, our hardware has really evolved a lot along with our infrastructure. And, and now we're, we're able to deploy a ton of different hardware uh, in more efficient and performant ways for, for our internal applications. Um, and I'd like to say that all these went without a hitch, but I think Brian spelled out some pretty good examples uh, a little bit earlier. We've made some new mistakes over the years. And uh, we thought it'd be fun to, to talk about some of these mistakes and the learnings we've got from it um, in, in areas that are even before uh, our Yosemite platform. So let's start. 
in the early days, um, we, had, we learned a lot of really basic things. And one of the more basic things that we learned was around sensors. So uh, let's take Freedom, for example. This was our very first compute server. And we thought, OK, we're going to strip everything we can out of Freedom, make it as cheap as possible. And one of the things that we stripped out, uh, which many of you probably know is a really critical component, is the BMC, the Baseboard Management Controller. And things seemed to be going well for a while, but we started noticing that certain servers in our data center were, were having some instability problems. Um, unfortunately, we had really no telemetry um, to, to look at to figure out what was going on. And we, uh, we went to the data center, we took measurements, we figured it out. We figured out actually it was uh, thermal and power related, and we had to make some significant changes in order to, to make this work pretty reliably. Uh, but because we had no BMC, we didn't know until we got there. So when we went to windmill generation, we said, okay, definitely taking that BMC out was a bad, bad idea. We'll add it back. <laughs> um, and we added the BMC in, but we didn't want to make too many changes. And uh, we ended up have actually uh, connecting it in such a way that the only way you could access it was through software. Um, and this was fine for most things. Uh, we were able to, to get a lot of good data, and, and we were able to mitigate a lot of issues. But the problem with that is if your server crashes, if your OS is not available, um, you actually can't talk to the BMC. So you would have to do like a post-mortem after you got everything working and figure out what, what did the BMC see. But by that time, you've already actually fixed the server. So kind of useless. <laughs> um, next, uh, if we look at kind of like our rack and power um, with our very first deployment of OpenRack V1, uh, actually, our power supplies didn't have any remote monitoring capabilities at all. So sometimes you would roll in a rack, some of those power supplies wouldn't come up or they would die, and there's no way to know about it remotely. So actually, people had to walk through the data center and look for red LEDs and swap those parts out, and it was really painful. Um, now, we had a, a smaller deployment at the time than we do now, but uh, definitely we don't want to make that mistake again. So, what did we learn at this time? Uh, well, first, I think it's really important that we have a robust set of sensors um, available for all the critical environmental data. So uh, power, thermal, uh, all the, the critical system things in the BMC system event log is super, super important. So we really have to have a robust way to do that. And since these early times of, of failure for us, uh, we've uh, definitely made sure that the, the BMC and all these sensors through a robust out-of-band mechanism were on the forefront. And we took that a step further with OpenBMC, I think, and we've really been trying to innovate in this space. Also, with OpenRack v2 um, on the power supply side, we, we made sure that uh, there is a robust way to measure the, the power conditions for all the supplies uh, directly through the top of rack switch. So um, next, if we move on to 2013, uh, from like a hardware failure standpoint, this is actually a tough year for us. Um, we, had, we had a lot of really good learnings. And the kind of two areas that uh, we had most of our learnings were, uh, one, on the supply chain side. And also, we, we learned some really valuable things about the importance of application testing. So if we look at our Winterfell design, uh, we went through a pretty, pretty good qual. We had a lot of uh, good data from, from Freedom and Windmill. And, and our, our validation went really smoothly. Um, and as we were getting close to the end, uh, our supply chain team noticed there was a good opportunity to purchase some cheap memory. Um, and they found these double density DIMMs. It was the, we could get the same capacity in our servers um, for lower cost. Why not try it? It's the same capacity, right? Well, it turns out that certain internal applications that we have didn't really care about that capacity. Actually, they cared about the bandwidth. And because we didn't populate all the DIMM slots, we use the same amount of memory uh, capacity as before, these applications really suffered. And so while some applications were OK, other ones uh, really weren't hitting their performance targets. And we had to do a lot of shuffling just to make sure that those applications had the, the performance they needed. Um, 2013 was also the year that we, we rolled out Knox, which was our first uh, storage chassis. And we wanted to get this out quickly. We wanted to really ramp up capacity, and we did. Uh, we made a mistake that uh, a lot of people do when they try to move quickly is we, we single sourced our vendors. Uh, so we went with latest, greatest hard drive technology and we, we did our qual, everything went great. Everything seemed like it was going good for about six months. And then we noticed uh, from application owners actually that they were having some performance issues on their side. Um, 
So unfortunately, we didn't have a whole lot of good telemetry data at the component level. And we never really saw this coming. So when the application owners uh, reported to us that they were having some issues, we started digging. And we found out that we were in the middle of an epidemic failure. Um, so this is a big problem because we were actually single source. We were really exposed. And um, no data was lost, but a lot of sleep was lost <laughs> uh, to try and, and, and take care of this issue. And I think the Knox, the Knox experience for us was really a wake-up call. Um, we, we learned that definite, like, besides just the, the servers and, and compute boxes, we need to make sure that we have good level of component monitoring for everything in our data center. So hard drives, DIMMs, whatever it happens to be, we need to make sure that we're monitoring these. And in a lot of cases, you can catch abnormal behavior before the failure cascade really happens. Um, and second, we, uh, we can't single source. <laughs> it's a big mistake. Um, it's, it's definitely, a, if, you, if you dual source or triple source, um, it's, it's going to take longer qual. You're going to have a lot more complexity to deal with. But uh, if, if something bad happens, you always have a fallback plan. Um, so in recent years, I think we, we've gotten a lot more mature uh, as, a, as a team. And we're actually able to launch a lot more hardware. Um, and so some of the easy mistakes we don't, we don't make anymore. Um, but we're still learning. We're always <laughs> constantly learning. And, and in, in recent years, one of the focus areas for us has been around uh, data center tooling. So in the Yosemite and, uh, and Wedge cases, when we first launched these, uh, we, we were trying to move quickly. There was a lot of things changing. Uh, we thought, well, hardware looks OK. Let's get in the data center, and we'll go from there. But a lot of our really basic tooling wasn't in place. Uh, what this means is that this hardware either took a lot of TLC just to get working or was idle. And it didn't really save us any time in the end because we could have done this stuff in advance and made sure that things were smooth and, and really pipe clean the process. Um, so to combat that uh, going forward, uh, we've actually integrated tooling as a first class citizen in, in our MPI process. So for uh, DVT exit and PVT exit, we have checkpoints just to make sure that all the basic tooling to provision, to monitor, um, all the basic things you need to, to use the hardware, they have to be ready before you can, before you can exit those phases. And you know, we've learned a lot of things. We've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but I, I think everybody here uh, who's, who's doing things at large scale understands when you do things at a large scale, hardware is eventually going to fail. Um, there's really nothing you can do about that. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, and so we need to keep this in mind when we approach sustaining. And so in the, in the, in the following slides, Brian's going to talk to this a little bit. But, uh, this is really kind of like our evolving um, philosophy for sustaining. And it, we've, we've been doing it over the last few years, but it's something that we're really focusing on now. And uh, we're just going to keep getting better and better. So there we go. All right, cool. Yeah, as Craig said, you know, when you deploy systems at a huge scale, no matter how good of a job you do during that product development phase, you are going to have a certain level of failure into the data center. And you need to be able to handle that uh, uh, failure as both you need to be able to predict or, or uh, assess where the failures are going to be, and then be able to handle those failures um, as they come up quickly. Because a hardware failure, you know, at a huge scale, can have can have big implications. You know, you can be taking down systems or, or cost a lot of money to get it fixed. So we really have four pillars uh, of how we uh, handle failures in the data center after after the hardware is deployed. You know, the first is based on monitoring. This is where we're collecting as much data from any hardware component that we can read data from. We want to read it and understand what's going on with that component. Um, the second piece is alarming, where you know, we want to put some automation around uh, our monitoring to see, uh, to know proactively where the failures are occurring or where they might be occurring. Um, third step is what we call remediation, and this is just fixing the failures. Um, this can be very automated or a very manual process, depending on the failure type. And then finally, we want to close the whole loop with design feedback, uh, whether that's to the current or next generation design. Anything we learn uh, through that sustaining phase, we want to make sure we don't you know, hit the same problem again later. Um, so first, we'll talk about monitoring. Go ahead. And, and the heart of our monitoring philosophy is what we call these hardware health dashboards. Um, so long story short, if we can read data from a hardware component, we want to create a dashboard around that uh, so we can understand if anything's 
going wrong there. And so we have component level dashboards, we have system level dashboards, we have dashboards on, on uh, logs that we can get from the operating system or logs that we can pull from the hardware, et cetera. Uh, and so like I said, if we can read it, we're gonna have a dashboard for it. Now, how do we use these dashboards? I'll give you a few generic examples of, of, of how we might use a dashboard. So this one shows uh, a very basic failure rate dashboard. And really, uh, failure rate, uh, comes from how many swaps have you done uh, on, a, on a specific component or set of components. And so uh, the first thing to look for is, hey, is the failure rate increasing over time? Um, and if that's the case, maybe that's indicative of a problem. Um, however, when you're looking at failure rate, you also have to take into account how many components you have in the fleet. You know, if you have a low number of components or uh, if you're migrating components in the fleet, your failure rate may be very spiky. At the same time, if your scale is huge, you know, even small increases in failure rate could cause or, or could signal a big problem. Um, the next thing we look at along with failure rate is the error type. And so um, this is our first level triage uh, when we do see failure rates go high. You know, this kind of stacked bar will tell you the different types of errors that are causing the different, the, 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 the swaps in the data center. You know, and even if, for example, the failure rate's low, we, we like to look at this data to see if there's any, you know, one failure type that's standing out that we may want to uh, proactively deal with. And then all of these kind of basic dashboards also have filters. And filters are kind of uh, a really useful tool, helps us with our first level triage. You know, if we see some failure rate or some uh, sign in a dashboard that we have a problem, this will help us drill down into you know, the scope and impact of that problem. You know, is it isolated to a single vendor or manufacturer? Is it isolated to a specific firmware version? You know, is it only happening in one data center or one region or on one uh, application tier? This type of information we can get quickly um, through these filters. All right. Second piece of, of our infrastructure around um, uh, sustaining is alarming. And this is definitely an area where we're, we're still learning, still improving, and still have a lot to do. Uh, but, you know, historically, our alarming has been like a guy sitting at his desk looking at a dashboard saying, hey, something's red. You know, and that's not scalable or sustainable over the long term. So we really want to set in place automated systems to let us know when something is anomalous in, the, in our fleet. Uh, and we have a few uh, general types of alarms we use. First would be uh, these kind of what we call cohort-based alarms. And these really help us look at configuration-specific problems. You know, one of our goals is to keep our, our number of configurations manageable, but you know, when you see the complexity of our data center fleet, that's sometimes hard to do. Um, so we can see from, uh, uh, by setting alarms on, on anomalous cohorts, we can see, hey, is this configuration causing a problem or that configuration causing a problem? Is it outside the bounds of, of, our, of our standard configuration sets? Another type is, is um, uh, failure rate trends. So over time, maybe the failure rate is not uh, above a certain threshold, but perhaps the long-term trend is that it's increasing. Uh, we can look at these and, and even before we get to that failure rate threshold, maybe uh, head off a problem before it comes. And then the last one's pretty obvious, but you know, a spike. And this could be a failure rate or it could be something else. Perhaps we see spikes of ECC errors on DIMMs. You know, these may not be causing an impact at the application level yet or a, a hard or fatal issue on the system, but they could be a sign of something going wrong um, in, that, in that system or may need a component replaced. Okay. So next stage uh, in our sustaining flow is to remediate. And this is basically to fix the problems that we see. Um, and the remediation, uh, you know, it could be simple, it could be complex. But the first step is root cause analysis. Uh, and sometimes this is done completely internal to Facebook with our uh, data center ops or uh, application teams to understand, you know, what is the failure. Sometimes we need to pull in help externally, you know, from a component vendor or our ODM partners, um, depending on what the failure is. Second is a remediation plan. And sometimes this happens even before we understand final root cause, but we need to understand enough of the root cause to have confidence that the remediation plan is solid. So we work with the, with the other teams impacted, you know, our, our tier owners, our data center our oper operations teams to understand what's the best plan that is gonna have the minimal impact 
um, to, to our operation. And for some things, if we can fix it in the software, you know, maybe the impact's pretty low. But as you go down the stack, the impact's going to grow and grow, uh, depending on what it is. You know, if we have to upgrade a firmware, that means we need to reboot a server, generally. Um, if we need to swap a component, we may have to take a, a, a server or a set of servers offline to do those swaps. And so those, those generally have a larger and larger impact. And finally, you know, we go into the implementation phase for the remediation. And depending on scale there, uh, we typically try to slow roll these remediations out. Because um, we've done some testing probably in the, in the remediation planning phase. We've validated the remediation solid. But we still want to make sure as we roll it out there aren't any unintended consequences to application performance or, or something else. So we'll start rolling it out over time, you know, if it's a firmware upgrade or maybe a hardware swap or something like that, and then see, uh, you know, hopefully that, 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 uh, that failure rate going down along as that remediation rolls out. Okay. Now, finally, we talk about design feedback. So any, any issue we find with the hardware or even our tooling uh, um, in the sustaining phase, we want to feed that back and, and get it fixed for current or future generations. So one example here goes back to the, the hard drive problem that, that Craig described. You know, as we were debugging that problem, what we noticed is we had much higher swap rates on, on hard drives in the, in the rear of the Knox chassis. And we dug a little farther, and we noticed a strong correlation between temperature and those swaps. So we were able to take this data, feed it back into our, our design team, and get uh, for the current generation, some, some rack level air improvements um, for the current generation NOx, and then a more robust solution to make sure we have a more even temperatures throughout uh, our hard drives, for example, in our new uh, Bryce Canyon storage, storage device. Okay, so that's kind of our sustaining flow. Um, it's actually a lot more chaotic <laughs> than, than probably looks here, but this is kind of the flow we go through to keep the systems up and running in the data center. Yeah, so it's pretty much all we got. So we'll just do a little bit of wrap up. Um, yeah, so three key takeaways uh, we're hoping you guys take away from this, this presentation is um, when you're growing your scale quickly, uh, it's really important that you innovate on your infrastructure. Expand that hardware portfolio, move quickly, and, and really try and solve those problems. I think the Yosemite test case or, or case example um, is a good example of, of a real innovation that's had a really good impact um, in order to help us scale faster. Um, and with that, uh, we do need to move fast, but it's also important that we keep a robust hardware lifecycle in order to not kind of repeat the same mistakes uh, over and over again. So it's really important that you strike that balance between being kind of fast and agile um, and having that robust a hardware lifecycle that, that can kind of keep feeding back on itself and, and making sure things are, are working well uh, earlier in the cycle. Uh, finally, uh, everything fails, <laughs> especially at a large scale. Uh, there's not much you can do about the failures, but hopefully you can have good tooling which can monitor, which can alarm, um, and you can catch it early and you can minimize the impact, uh, especially for uh, a company in the cloud like us, availability is really important. And so catching those failures early before the, the cascade happens is, uh, is really important. Anyway, um, I think that's it for us. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, please let us know. Yeah, I have a question. Um, how do you strike that balance? Um, I know like, like you took a bunch of stuff out in the beginning and then you found some that need to be added back in. How do you avoid becoming the, you know, a 20 year old bloated P PC 20 years from, you know, how do you, how do you avoid that, that trap that companies fall into over time? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. Um, for us, at least on our team, we have a process. Before we start every cycle, we go and look through our quals. We see what we can combine. We see what we can automate. Uh, we make sure that we don't sacrifice the coverage, but we make it as light of a process as we can make it. So we're looking not just at the tests we run, but how we run them. Um, and, and that's really important, at least from a validation standpoint, to do it. And, and we, we're also looking at this uh, at, at multiple levels. So Brian talked about the supply chain side. Um, those optimizations we made, uh, they're, they're going to help us be a lot more agile and be a lot more flexible and really be able to scale. Uh, 
Uh, what, what kind of tools do you use um, to do your testing? Like uh, any automation or tools that you use? Yeah, um, we, have, we have quite a few tools. Uh, I would say some of the more useful ones for us are we have uh, a bunch of dashboards built around actually managing our validation. So we have test cases, tasks, we can assign them to people, make sure that, that everyone's in a loop and, and all those things are getting done and accountable for. Um, and we have a few different automation frameworks based around Python that allow us to, uh, to run things very efficiently and track the results in dashboards and also build new test cases that make the, the coverage even better. Actually, the talk after this, uh, Fava, it's going to go into that a little bit, some of the automation. Yeah. Oh, highly recommended you guys check that one out. It's in this room. Oh, highly recommended you stay where you are. <laughs> During the life cycle on the sustain phase, you said don't touch that. And then the last statement was hardware breaks. How, how, do, you, how do you go about uh, break fix? Is it whole unit swap? Do you do component level swap? How do you sort of manage the other failures like soft failures like firmware updates, bugs in the firmware, and all that stuff? So I, I think we want to we want to touch as little as possible. Yeah. And so uh, if we can get a fix purely in software, uh, that's going to be the easiest, fastest to roll out. Generally, the least impact to the whole fleet. Um, as we go down the stack, you know. From a firmware update point of view, we do have automated tooling that will update the firmware. And so we can work that into uh, some of our tooling, like when a system needs to be rebooted, it's going to get or re image, it'll get its firmware updated. Anyway. Um, and then finally, at the hardware level, you know, it's, it's generally component level swaps. Um, you know, we have, we have predefined FRU or, or replaceable, field replaceable units for every server. Um, and so, you know, things like a DIM are generally a FRU or things like a CPU or, or um, depending on what, it, what the system is, um, they'll be replaced at the FRU level. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the session. Uh, this is more related to the application uh, deployment. Are there any kinds of apps that don't fit to be deployed on OCP, or like vertical apps versus horizontal, and what do you guys do for that? Like, are there burst scenarios or whatnot where you use cloud or like cloud, which is not the private OCP cloud, but something else? Not, not really. Um, there may be a few very special cases like that we keep isolated in the infrastructure, um, but you know, for our application owners, kind of have that as their base requirement. Like, they need to be. Uh, running on top of the OCP gear. Great, thanks. All right, I guess we're done. Thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, everybody.